how's it going? You're listening to Estranged. And today we're pretty excited because we have Todd McGowan. Uh, you probably know him from his podcast, uh, uh, Why Theory, W-H-Y, or some of his books. Some of his books that he's written are um, Identity Politics and Universality. That's his latest one. And then he did Emancipation After Hegel before that. And before that, it was uh, Capitalism and Desire. Right, Todd? That's right. Yeah. And, and you've written a few books also on film that I just got, actually. I hadn't gotten your books on film. Um, but I, I've seen you sort of like in your books, you've made a turn towards more explicitly political things rather than film. I mean, I think you still use some film examples, but is that true? You've been a little bit more about like explicit politics? Yeah, that's true. Like I've, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, exactly. I think you put it exactly right. Like I still use film as an example, but I'm, mm -hmm. I think I've probably written my last book just on film. Yeah. And you're also a professor in Vermont. That's true. That's true. And you're I'm still, still and you're, st and it, your the things that you primarily teach are still film. Yeah. But I also like once a year or something, I get to teach a pure theory class and, or a class on like, I, teach a class on Hegel or we read Hegel's phenomenology. So I get to do a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Todd has been on the podcast before. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's funny. We always have this thing of like, I am, I actually think I'm like unable to judge when to like sit, start a point, which I think is not good for podcasting. <laughs> we constantly talk over each other. I was just going to ask Todd, like when, uh, was there like a particular turn for you in terms of shifting towards the more kind of political theoretical? Yeah, that's a good question. I just, um, I guess I felt like I had said everything I could say about film. And so yeah. that's part of what turned me away from it. But I, I, I don't know, I, I felt like I was more interested in, in political theoretical questions. I guess I always have been, and I, for me, originally film was a vehicle for that. And then mm -hmm. I thought, well, I could just talk about that without the vehicle. And I wasn't sure if anyone would read those books. And some people, I guess, have enough that presses keep one of publishing them. So uh, that's, I, you know, that's, that's it. I, I guess I always really would have done that. But I felt like I, the only way I could get the ideas out there was in the form of writing on film. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about um, in terms of like the film theory side of things where perhaps you position yourself differently to a lot of like the canonical film theory and actually the perspective perhaps that you have does lend itself more towards the actual political and that a lot of the kind of mode of you know film theory is by kind of by the form that it's taken less political by definition i think that's absolutely true right like the within the world of film theory, if it's even theoretical anymore, much at all, it's, it's almost, it's, it's completely de devoid of uh, political content, yeah. I think, more and more. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you've been doing uh, more steady videos on YouTube, right? And those are excellent. I really oh, thank have you. enjoyed those a lot. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so for the episode, we thought that we would ask Todd what are his favorite what is his favorite movie of every decade since from the twenties up to now? And it was a pretty interesting uh, list. Should we go over the the titles? Sure, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, for nineteen twenties, you chose uh, what second? Let me bring it up. Battleship Potemkin, right? Yeah, it, uh, Battleship Potemkin, and then for nineteen thirties, M by Fritz Lang. Then to be or not to be, Ernst Lubitsch. Then 1950s, Mr. Cadden, um, which is also, it, it has a different name, I think, for... It's also known as Confidential Report. Confidential Report, that's right. Yeah. And then High and Low for the 1960s, uh, Three Days of the Condor, 1970s, 1980s, Paris, Texas, 1990s, Fight Club, 2000s, Lost in Translation, and then 2010s, Certified Copy. Um, should we go just like one by one and then you can tell us why it's your favorite film and how it has uh, sort of like added something to your work? Sure. sure. I was just going to say before we start, Adrian made a joke yesterday because when we were looking at the list and catching up on some of the words maybe we hadn't seen or hadn't seen for a long time, um, both of us use this platform actually as Adrian, he put it me onto it called Streamio and I thought this was like a real 
you know, case in point, as you know, often you talk about, Todd, about how inefficient capitalism is, because you would think like all these great movies, you should be able to find them, you know, the market would have found a way because they're so great and so many people obviously would want to watch them to find them online or on right. some platform to pay for them. But you literally can't many of them, you know, you can only watch them on some like pirate bay torrent thing. So. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it's fascinating. But this is a great one because it's, you don't have to download the torrents. You can just stream them from this app. So that's pretty good because it, it's a little bit dangerous to be like downloading torrents and everything. Yeah, I know. I, I don't do it myself. <laughs> so yeah. pretty, I was too much of a steady cat until you put me on train. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. But should we start with uh, Battleship Potemkin? Sure. I think, uh, you know, uh, so Potemkin, I think, is for me the only silent film that's not a comedy that I can watch and just enjoy as if it's a contemporary film. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons I put it as in the 20s, the era uh it just really to me it's the it's like the it's like the high point of 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 silent cinema and i think what makes it that way what makes it that sorry is that it it's the first time that that montage really gets i think it's the point at which the idea of montage which is editing things together to make some in, in the for eisenstein some political statement i think that's it's that's that's where montage really gets used for the first time to the and almost the best it's ever been used. So like I think the Odessa step sequence from Battleship mm -hmm. Potemkin is maybe the the best edited sequence in the history of cinema. Maybe like so it's so for me that really it just stands out for the way in which it uses editing and makes you think about what's the way it positions you as a spectator just through editing. I think that's 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 what's pretty great about it. And and also I don't know that there's ever been another film that creates a collective protagonist. I think there's something about film that individualizes the protagonist. Like it, it's more conducive, and maybe this is true of the novel as well, conducive to, an, to having an individual protagonist. But I think Eisenstein really succeeds in creating a collective proletariat as the protagonist of that film. So I think that's, so to me, it, I think it's really one of the five great films of all time and 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 just for me it's also as i said just for me personally it's just an enjoyable film to watch for that reason that it that it it the way it's edited together and then the way that it forms the collective hero it is amazing I I feel like, go ahead so i was gonna say i kind of feel like it's, it's the montage is really what takes film from theater to cinema you know it's the thing that really transforms it into this new kind of uh art form and to me yeah theater is very different to to cinema and you know there's the like Roland Barthes thing of the readerly text and the writerly text almost like for me I think like the lines get crossed with cinema I think that like what becomes more writerly is what is more readerly in cinema so the thing like almost the more visceral it is and the more involving the more writerly it becomes in terms of like the political potential the universal potential of film um but yeah no it's crazy to watch it it's like it feels so modern cannot believe it's a hundred years old almost. I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think that it's such a good point that you made. Like, I think that it's the one silent film where people act like they're in a sound film, right? Like, and I think it's because of the editing, like they're yeah. like in other silent films, even the great silent comedies, the actors act like they're on the stage, yeah. right? They don't act, they haven't yet made that turn to the subtlety of a, of a sound film. And and I think in Potemkin, they, the actors, nobody overdoes it, right? Yeah. They're acting like they're in a, in a sound film. And I think, you're, I think it's what the key to that is the montage. So that makes it, it's montage that really brings it out of the theatrical, brings film out of the theatrical into the filmic. Yeah. And also one of the things that I notice is that sometimes you'll see the subtitles for what somebody just said. And th that's interesting, but sometimes it becomes a little bit, uh, not so chronologically obvious in the sense that it will say something on the subtitles or the, the, the cards that it, it could either describe what happened right before it or after it. And there's something about that that I think is very special of just like having this thought of language while you're watching the scene that comes after it, it, it gives it so much more uh, meaning. And I read one of your essays on this on this film, and I thought it was very interesting that you said that the montage basically 
uh, allows for the enjoy the enjoyment in this case of uh, sort of like the oppressive power to come out and you can see it because it's so prolonged that you see every little detail rather than if you would just be there present actually in the moment the sort of like what what cinema sort of brings to the surface is all these little details that become signifiers towards enjoyment in this case. Yeah, that's, I really like the way you put that. And I, I think that that, you know, in the famous Potemkin scene, I mean, sorry, the Odessa steps scene, uh, the, the fact that Eisenstein doesn't even show everything as it, ha he repeats things so that we yeah. see it happen multiple times, I think it adds to the detail and adds to the sense of the enjoyment that the that those soldiers have in just gunning down the innocent people. So I think that's, to me, it's one of those great examples of filmic, like where we see the excess in the, in the, the editing actually makes the excess, right? Like you wouldn't, if he didn't edit it together in the way that he does, you wouldn't see the excess in the soldiers and in the violence, their oppressive violence, but you see it because of the editing. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, sorry, go on, Adrian. No, I was just going to say that I feel like that was just kind of completely missing from the ripoff from uh, The Untouchables. Because they, they have that same thing, where it's just like yeah, the baby yeah. carriage going down the stairs, but yeah. it just didn't feel the same. This was a lot more uh, pointed, I guess. I know. It's, it makes you think that he copied the scene to show that Eisenstein can't be copied. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I kind of feel like, yeah, the, the the final scene as well, when the you know the the battleship is kind of approaching, and the the, the repetitious, like um, really over. Well, I don't know. It feels excessive, but it's obviously not because it's making a point. Editing, um, but it, it's interesting because like he almost like twists the genre before the genre even exists. You know, right, like, right. Editing, right. whatever. Film right, is. like it's a it's a kind of an action genre yeah. action film in a way, but it, you're right. Like he just he, it's, I, I love that idea that you could twist the genre before the genre. Like yeah. he almost twists the genre into existence, and you could even say that the development of the genre is a kind of retreat from what Eisenstein sets up as a possibility at That's its very beginning. True. Yeah, I know because he really undercut. You know, the, the the reveal at the end. You know, where they kind of like read each other's brothers. Yeah, it does really kind of flip the beat as yeah, well. what what no action film ever ends that way right they yeah. always end with the victory of the one side over the other but here yeah. we get the collectivity formed right exactly yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah and the other thing that i thought was interesting that i guess it's also been influential is the red the red flag that also got used by uh, uh spielberg in schindler's list do you think there's a connection there or not really oh the, the color red gets yeah. highlighted yeah. Um, was Spielberg alluding to that? I don't know. <laughs> that would be interesting if he was. I mean, I, I don't know what I feel. I, I guess uh, I'm sort of mixed feelings about Schindler's List, but mm -hmm. uh, I do think that, that he was trying to show, I mean, he, is he, he's using that red, that moment of when the only moment of color in the film to get us to see that there's something that's singular that stands out. And, and, I don't know, maybe that's the idea in Potemkin too. So maybe it's the same idea at work. In, but I've always thought of, in some ways, Schindler's List as the antipode to, to Potemkin, just because it's so, fo it like takes this collective event and so focuses on this individual hero. And so I guess, I mean, that's how I always have read the, the use of the red was it's trying to make a particular, turn this universal event into this one particular, like emphasize this particular victim. But yeah. I don't know, maybe I, I guess I could see it the other way that, that it's like a way that color is meant to show that this one stands in for all. I think right. maybe that works. Yeah. I also like it that it's maybe the first instance in film that there were like breaking the fourth wall. Because sometimes you have that with like, I don't know, Annie Hall, where Woody Allen turns to the camera right. and he's talking directly. I feel like it's like the, the editing itself is like making a point. And yeah speaking directly with a sudden color that is like maybe not meant to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's right. I think it's speaking to, to the spectator directly. Yeah. Should we go to the next one? Yeah. Um, Fritz Lang, let's do it. So what? Did, why, why is this one of your favorite films? And, uh, okay, so uh, the 30s is an interesting decade because I think it's not a great filmic mm -hmm. decade. I think it's, um, you know, they're just getting sound. They're just, there's, they're, I think some of the films uh 
sort of it's a, this return to what Helen just mentioned earlier, this return to theatrical roots of film, I think is sort of bedevils the cinema in the thirties. But I think Lang's, Lang's film, it really, I, to me, it's his great masterpiece, even though he made obviously made some good films before, great films before and great films afterward. But I, I guess what I love about it is the way that it takes a, someone the most despicable kind of, figure and allows us to feel sympathy for that figure and i think that turn in the film where we are like we see so the whole film we're we're made to detest the peter laurie character and and fear him really and then i think at the end when the when the crowd turns on him in this in this uh mock trial that they put him under like then everything shifts. And I, I think all of a sudden our sympathy is drawn to him, even though it shouldn't be. And I feel like it's a precursor of that great turn at the end of Silence of the Lambs, where the lector says, I'm having an old friend for dinner. And then we're actually happy. It's a little bit different because there we're, we're happy that he's going to eat someone. And you're like, oh my God, I'm just, I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that someone's going to be eaten. Um, but here we're on this and you realize like, oh my God, I'm on the side of this child murderer. And I think that's, I think that for long to do that and to show that film can accomplish that is really, there's something great in that gesture. And I think that really that's kind of the political gesture to, not that we should identify with child murders, but that our ability to identify with the person who's, or those who are in the, in the position of the exile, I think mm -hmm. is the key to any political activity. It's interesting that, yeah, it's 1930s Germany, just what, what is on the horizon, you know, how that can. I know, and I think there's a way in which that crowd surrounding him is a kind of precursor of, of the Nazi crowd. I yeah. think that's he's exactly anticipating that. Yeah, that's crazy. And, you know, Hitler, Hitler and, and, and Goebbels loved this film. So they, they, they saw, because they saw the power of film in it, even though they, they, didn't, they didn't like its message. So, so, so you know the story, right? That they came to, that Goebbels came to Long after he saw, I think it's after he saw um, the, the Dr. Mabuza, Testament of Dr. Mabuza. And he said, uh, we want you to be the Nazi. The, the, the gig that eventually went to Leni Reifenstahl, mm -hmm. they offered to Fritz Long. And, and so I think, and he said, no, he said, I'm Jewish. And then Goebbels said, we decide who's Jewish and who's not, uh, which is a great line. Uh, anyway, so I, I, I love that, that it's this, that it's a lot, the Nazis who were great at propaganda saw that, the, the, that this film had the, the power of film was present in it. Yeah, absolutely. I find the Lenny Reef and Star like such a question, such an interesting one. I think, it, you know, it's one of those times when the, whatever the trope is about whatever the political perspective is, is kind of blown out of the water a little bit, you know, but um, yeah, <laughs> and I, also, I also like the idea of like, well, I, this is a weird thing to say, but women can be baddies, you know, and also not, you know, it's very complicated, but that a woman filmmaker, it's something that annoys me immensely, you know, has some like particularist, uh, magical, lovely position because they're a woman, you know. <laughs> like, I know, and she yeah. she really nicely refutes that idea. I think. Yeah. Um, I really like about, you know, about M, the, the opening sequence, you know, the uh, talking about montage in relation to the previous film, it's all done in absence, you know. Um, right. It's, yeah. I mean, in terms of making film, you know, there's this idea of show not tell, whatever, but this is the most, the most show, show not tell of anything I think I've ever seen. Right, but it's interesting, it, do, it does the show not tell by not showing. By not <laughs> it's showing little, anything, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, oftentimes the killing is shown by just a balloon floating, mm -hmm. right? Like, that's an amazing sequence, and it's horrifying to watch, and yet yeah. you don't see anything, so. But I guess, yeah, I guess what it sets up, the, you know, the, the child murderer to be, so uh frightening and then right. by definition you know the the flip at the end where you feel empathy is all the more exaggerated right i think if we had seen I, I mean obviously at the time you couldn't show what he was doing but if we had seen it i think it would have detracted from the horror associated with him i think he becomes a much 
you know, it's like the way, I mean, this is true about any villain or any, any, uh, any monster, like when not seeing them. This is what's great about the original thing, I think, that mm -hmm. you don't, it's what you don't see. And then Carpenter makes everything visible in his version. And it's great, I think, but it's a little lesser than the Hawks, the earlier Hawks film. And I think that Long really gets a, gets that, like what you can show by not showing something. I yeah. think it's really, this film is one of the best at that. I was going to ask you, Todd, do you think that towards the end, in the end sequence where they have this like fall uh, sort of like chord thing, um, do you empathize, do you empathize with the killer or do you sort of like, are you kind of scared of that? I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, do you empathize with the killer or do you empathize with sort of like the system of law? like that's supposed to be like legitimate because there's a sort of relief that that comes when you see the hand of like the, the authorities that finally right. got there. Right. right. Um, do you think that really, it, it, I don't know. I, f I feel like maybe the subjectivity gets like sort of put to the test there and it's a little bit scary because you don't know what to think. And then sort of like the law comes to, to sort of like reestablish order in a way that you don't have to think about it so much anymore. Yes. So you think that's a, you think there's a retreat at the end of the film by having the law come in. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's right because yeah. you, you're right. You're definitely right that you feel tremendous relief as a spectator when the law comes, the actual law comes and arrives. So I think, yeah. I think it would have been a better film if Long would have kind of gone all the way with that and let us see the mob being victorious, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that would have been, which would have been more hor I think he thought it would have been too hard to watch though, mm -hmm. really. You know, I think yeah. he would have. Yeah, it, it's funny that, that, that rescuing the child murderer can be a happy ending, but I think that it does. I think you're right. Like it is a kind of happy ending to the film. Um, and because I do think that our identification, I think we're afraid of the mob, right? And, and we want legality. Like that's what we, that, like the whole film is really about this. We want the law to save us from this guy. And then we want the law to save this guy too. So I think you're right. Like that, that maybe compromises the, I, it's too bad. Cause I, I think that that, uh, I love the film otherwise, but I did, I think you're right that that's a little bit of a problem. What, uh, what do you? I was just gonna. Yeah, I was just gonna ask. What do you think is sort of what would happen if we would overcome this like fear of the mob? And or, do you think it's a necessary fear, like a, a necessary sort of repression that the mob doesn't get to decide everything, or is there something to it that if we would actually take the time to, for example, the, the, everything that's going on with Black Lives Matter and people want to abolish the police, there's this question of like what comes to take its place and it, is it the mob or is it some sort of like private thing that further sort of like hides our involvement with it more than just like sort of like a public department like the police right if it's pro that would be disastrous wouldn't it if the police yeah. got eliminated and private forces got replaced yeah. them, that would, i can't imagine anything worse uh yeah i think i i don't that's an interesting question. Like, does the mob, you know, Freud, I think was very, he thought the mob was inherently negative, right? But um, I don't know, like the, I think there is this double thing to ma the mass always. Like on the one hand, there's the, and I think it's related to this idea of, of the relationship between law and big other, that sometimes the mass is just embodying the big other. And I think that's what happens at the end of, of M, right? It's just, they're just the force of the big other, this like collective they that's, and it, I think that's always an oppressive force. But then on the other hand, I think that the mass, and I think this is what's happening in Black Lives Matter, they, their, their movement is actually in some way, not, it's not has to do with the police, it has to do with the law as such and like something in the law that's not being that they're respecting by coming together as a group. And so I think there's these, and I don't know how you, I mean, I think they are separate, but I don't know that you can legislate their or theorize how they're separate because I think those two can kind of, one can come into the other. And, and like, I mean, look at the, the KKK is an interesting example because I think they're a mob that's completely driven by the, they're like a big other mob, but they thought they were, 
acting legalistically, you know? So, so what, how a, how a group conceives of itself is not always how it really is acting. So I think it's a great question though, like, like to the extent to which we should have faith in the, in the mass, in the mass, like that's, I think it's a great, it's, a, I just think it's up in the air. I think it's always to be decided. I don't think there's, I don't think you can say like the mass is always wrong or the mass is always right. Like I think there's right. always these, these ways in which you can, but I think you have to psychically, like even though it's not an individual psyche, it's a mass psyche at work and that, and thus you can see like what the function psychically it has, right? And I think that's what M clearly shows that that mob is functioning as a, they're, they're oppressive because they're invested in the, uh, they're, they're invested in this other, not in any kind of notion of law, even though they think they're executing the law. And I also think it's very interesting that, because it's almost like the, the film asks that question itself, because they, they're trying to figure out how they can catch the killer, but without it being the police. And what they find is like, it should be homeless people, precisely those that are sort of symbolically in some way outside of the law. So they don't resort to this sort of like private enterprise in order to catch the killer. They sort of find what is like, what can't be incorporated into the law. Right. I think Jacques Rancière would have to be happy about what they do, right? Like they, they, <laughs> yeah. they appeal to the part of no part. Like they, exactly. you know, yeah, I think it's an interesting, which I think you're right, like really makes it more complex as a, as a film. Because politically, we, I think a lot of us would think that was a pretty good move. But, but they're mm -hmm. using it in a way to circumvent any kind of like actual, you know, justice for the guy, I think. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Helen? I was going to say about, you know, the question of is the mob, I don't know, well, this, the mob is the right word, but the people, let's say, are always right. And of course, that's the question of democracy. And perhaps, you know, I think the political situation in the UK, the US and others is quite uh, indicative of this question right now. And I think, you know, what we saw with Brexit, I think that question was clear for a lot of legislators this question of well the people the group voted for this but is it legal or is it the right thing or whatever you know I think there is this kind of visible divide between uh, the voice of the group the mass the people and yeah, I don't know what but it is it's just an interesting question that you can really see and I can kind of see you know in terms of how we have um, those in power being um, extremely conservative right wing and then i would say a different version of the right but a different flavor let's say within the culture and how there's this big division and this kind of um question of how we could live in a culture where we see this where this is voted in yeah i think it's a it's a great question like it, it i think that there's you know, the, the question is, does the people know what it wants, right? Like, I don't, I think they often don't. And I think that there's, like, there's always this internal divide within the mass of people. And I think that's why they can, it can always go either way, right? Like, I don't think you can, in other words, I don't think you can say like, oh, the people have this, like, that was the what people said in response to Brexit. Like, we can't vote again because the people have decided, mm -hmm. right? Well, okay, but did they, I think it's always wrong to to like lean, to fall back on this. The people know exactly what they wanted because they're always, you know, like people didn't know what the result would be. You know, they didn't know what the implications would be. Oh, there's all these other things, mm -hmm. right? And and I think, so that divide, I guess that's what I find interesting about M really is that it really tries to explore this divide within the people. Like, and the and to what extent a mass can act ethically. I think that's kind of, one of the huge questions that she's trying to ask, and I think long things to know. Like, I think it's very much a Freudian attack on the mass, really. Even though it's also obviously, he has no sympathy for the child murderer, but I think that in, in the end, what he's really looking at is the logic of the mass and how that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. very interesting. Should we go to the next one? Otherwise, we're gonna end up at two hours. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Did we end up. We were doing. We did an ABCs like the term and the jargon we use, and we got through what like ten terms in an hour or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, let's go to "To Be or Not to Be," Ernst Lubitsch, nineteen forty-two. Can you tell okay, us about so, that one? 
Yeah, so yeah. here I did not, I picked, so obviously the, I'm not picking the greatest film of the 40s because that's just Citizen Kane. And I'm picking, I even like Kane maybe better, but I thought To Be or Not To Be would be interesting to talk about. And and I love it. And I've seen it probably 30 times. So I guess it's, to me, it's one of the, it's, I think it's the great film comedy really of all mm -hmm. in the whole history of cinema. And I think what's great about it is that it, it, it's satirizes Nazism, which seems like it can't be satirized, but in a way that shows how even Nazism, which we think is this version of diabolical evil, that even the Nazis are copying a copy. Like it's all, they're always, the things that are evil are, are always just, everything can be copied and everything is a copy of something else. So this idea that you know, this idea in, in it's sort of first in Hegel, then in Lacan, that truth has the structure of a fiction. I think that's maybe ex executed in to be or not to be better than in any other film, because the fiction always comes first. And then the truth, my favorite, I have to say one of the scenes. So, so Jack Benny who's playing uh, Joseph Tura, this actor in Poland, he imitates this uh, German commandant and the guys and, and, and he, his name's Colonel Earhart. And he keeps going, so they call me concentration camp Earhart. And, and when he doesn't have anything to say to this guy, he just repeats this line. And, and, and when he gets to the real Colonel Earhart, he says the exact same thing. So it's like, and then Jack Benny goes, I knew you'd say that. And so, so it's great how the actor does the part first and then the real person comes and repeats the yeah. same thing. Yeah. What did you think about it, Helen? I was going to say, so this is a, a film that Zizek talks about a lot in terms of the idea of uh, the only being able to make comedy out of real tragedy, that tragedy can only be made out of something that isn't quite fully tragic. Yeah. Um, as in, you know, all the, all the great films about the Holocaust and, and things like that. And, you know, and obviously there are, there are some great comedy movies about uh, totalitarian dictators and things like that. But um, yeah, that when you have a, a tragic situation, you know, in order for a tragedy in terms of like a, a narrative structure, you still have to somebody to have somebody who is able to have some kind of power to generate a story and, you know, right. achieves, you know, just narrowly miss achieving something. So yeah, to anything that is truly, truly tragic cannot really be fictionalized as a tragedy. Almost. Right, right. No, it's really true. And I, I think that, 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 like this, this, I, this, jo the great joke about the concentration camps in the film, like uh, in the, in the camps, uh, the Poles do the camp, the Nazi guy says the, the Poles do the camping and we Nazis do the concentrating. I just, I think that's one of the great <laughs> jokes about a concentration camp, but you could like, the, oh, I think to your point, like it's really a way to get, it's like comedy is a way to get at the horror of the Holocaust in a way that, and I, I th obviously if the Holocaust had actually, it's, so it's 42, it's before the final solution, mm -hmm. but obviously he couldn't have made the film once that they knew that there were death camps, right? Yeah. But, um, but still, thank God he was able to make it because it's, it's really, and you know, this is an interesting story about it. So Jack Benny, when he looked at the script, he knew it was the greatest part he would ever have in his life. And he had constant nervous breakdowns on the state on this on the set because he was so afraid he was going to screw up this great like this greatest thing that he ever got so it's, i find that very kind of touching yeah, that's so amazing to, to, to be able to predict that it's interesting though, the idea of a uh, copies comes up quite a lot in the list of films you know is this something that you're kind of thinking about theoretically at the moment yeah i guess i just i didn't mean to copy myself like that but <laughs> but yeah i i, I am always t I've, i'm so taken by that idea yeah. that the copy comes first and then the original is actually formed on the basis of the copy i love that idea i mean it's yeah. you know this idea from freud it's the german term is not that the the later thing Mm -hmm. makes the earlier thing and I, mm -hmm. I, I i'm really taken with that notion of causality that the future creates Absolutely. the past yeah yeah Todd, I I'm wondering talk about this a lot in terms of relationships you know that yeah yeah that's really I know it's something that's like really difficult to grapple with in terms of because obviously you project a future into something but it may not come to pass but then the thing yeah i don't know anything things become especially when you meet something things become like some, you know, in, in, when you kind of narrativize it, you know, this was meant to happen and they love at first sight and the meet cute trope and movies and stuff, but almost like all of that stuff is in retrospective, you know, 
Right, exactly. Yeah, right, yeah. Like, 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 think about how many people you actually met cute. There were tons exactly, of them, exactly. but only one has the function of an actual meet cute for your yeah. life, I think. Right. Yeah. Todd, so I'm wondering if you could quickly sort of do a, a, a distinction between uh, this movie and something theoretical or close to Schindler's List, because you've mentioned the story before, and I wonder where you get uh, so many interesting stories about cinema, but that Stanley Kubrick was doing an interview, and they asked him, why don't you, the last thing maybe you have to do is this uh, movie about the Holocaust, and he said, it's impossible to do, it's, what about Schindler's List, and it's like, well, that's not a movie about the Holocaust, it's about 10,000, how, or how much, 1,000 Jews, that's right. right. Yeah, if he goes, the Holocaust is a story about 6 billion Jews who died, Schindler's List is a story about 1,000 Jews who lived, yeah. Right, but this, how is this, um, I mean, I, I believe it's different, but it's, you said that it sort of like satirizes Nazism and it, it succeeds in a way that Schindler's List doesn't by sort of like narrativizing the event. Uh, what do you think that distinction lies? Well, I think that, uh, yeah, it's a good question. Cause I, I do think that there's a real I think this film succeeds where Schindler's List fails. And I think part of it is that it, it tries to, and I think this is tied to what Helen was saying, like it uses comedy to undermine the Nazi project. Whereas I think, I think Schindler, I think at times there are these moments where Schindler's List comes close to doing something that undermines the project. Like there's this moment, I think there's this great moment where Gertz, the, the, played by uh, Ray Fiennes is, is just shooting Jews at random in the camp. Right. And I find that just one of the scenes that just really kind of by capturing the horror of Nazism, it, it really, it got something and, and, and was effective. But, but really the problem is that, that I think, and this is I think the real difference that, that in To Be or Not To Be, Nazism is really a political move. Like you can see the politics of it. And in Schindler's List, they're just evil, right? Like I think this right. is, to me, this is one of the real problems in the way Nazism is disseminated into the culture is that it's just Nazis are bad guys. They're evil. But but no, they have a political position, yeah. right. a political project. And I think when we don't see that, I think we that's what really opens the door to this to like a lot of political confusion and the way that leftists can be called Nazis and what yeah. like that just seems absurd to me because you know, Nazism is a far right wing political philosophy. It's not, it's not immoral. I mean, it's immoral in some sense, but that's not the, that's not the deep problem with it. And I think to be or not to be gets at the political in a way right. that Schindler's doesn't. Absolutely. It kind of misses the mark, right? Like by, by focusing on the violence, it's missing sort of like what justifies the violence in their view. Absolutely. Yeah. Like what allow, like, isn't the question really what makes Nazism a convincing philosophy for someone to take up like that's the right. whole question yeah. and you could what you watch schindler's list 20 times you would never have any insight into that question at all absolutely i think there's yeah. like there's, there's two sides to it like obviously and the word nazi gets thrown around so much at the moment but you know part of the problem in terms of our current situation is the uh belief yeah that some people are inherently evil and that's just the way they are and we just need to eliminate you know white men or whatever or this inherent particularism and this was a group and it just happened and they were evil and that's it so you know you've got that side of it and that obviously misses the actual political potential but also the question of like the political economy that or yeah the ideology itself which is more evil than just an evil person you know so, right right yeah. right i mean the, well that's a whole i think that's a huge question like and i don't think anybody has really broached that like what is the socioeconomic conditions mm -hmm. that are ripe for the breeding of Nazism. Like that's a whole, right. like there's a certain aspect of capital yeah, that absolutely. breeds these kind of fascist mm. uprisings. And yeah. I think to understand exactly what the situation within capital is that mm -hmm. is conducive to that, I don't think anybody has really fully explored that. Because when you, when you think about World War II as a war of liberalism, not a war of just evil Nazis, then, you know, it kind of changes. Yeah, you yeah, know, the that's right. Actual thing that we need to think about. Right, it's an internal. I think that's exactly right, Helen. It's an internal battle within the liberal world. Right, mm -hmm. that's what World War Two was. And it's kind of crazy yeah. that it comes so early. World War Two happens so you know, World War One is a different kind of war of, and it's only you know, like thirty-ish years later. So so soon into this new project, 
that happened. You know, it's kind of right. like well, it's, it's it's 20 happened. years, really, right? Yeah, it's 20, 20 yeah. It's, yeah, like 18 to, to 39. Yeah, it's 20 yeah, years. 20 years. Yeah. yeah. Should we go to uh, Mr. O'Cadden? Yeah, let's go to that one. That's my favorite all time film. So it's great. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what are your thoughts on it? So, I, I, so the, first of all, this was made, as you point out, there's another title for it. It got, Wells made it with his own money. It was constantly, the production was constantly interrupted. So a lot of the versions, the talking isn't synced really well to the, to the people's uh, faces. So, but I think what I love about this film is the way that someone is trying, Mr. Arkad and the guy is trying to erase his own past. And I, I just love this idea that, that you can, you can, that the, 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 what the detective is trying to discover is the self erasure of the criminal. And I think that's, th there's a way in which maybe that's, that desire to erase your own origins is really, I kind of think that there's something essential about subjectivity, like that's maybe something essential to subjectivity because there's always this crime, whatever, it, I mean, crime is maybe too large of a word, but crime at the origin of all our subject forms of subjectivity. And so we're constantly, just like we're through a treglakite, we're going back and discovering our meat cute. We're also yeah. trying to erase this original crime, either in the society or just in ourselves. And I think, to me, Mr. Arkadin is the best film about that, that process. And I think it's real, you know, when I first saw it, I saw it on a, I was just, I had just taken my, uh, my PhD general exams. I was kind of relaxing. And there's a, there a double feature of third man and Mr. Arkadin. And I just watched it on whatever AMC or some channel. And I was just, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I just was like, my God, it's a, it's an amazing, because I just had never seen, it's, it's very noir film noir like, right. But it, it's just such a diff. I mean, in all noir is like is about the origin of the of what, that discovery. But I th I felt like it just went into it in a way that no other film had. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah this question of like, I mean, I always think that you know when qu people ask like nature and nurture, I always think like nature is nurture. You know, I, I, it's funny both both Adrian and I are doing psychoanalysis at the moment, <laughs> and it's you know obviously just really kind of like. Uh, uh, I don't know, like it's like an auto ethnography almost. It's like right, you are right. you are your origin, you know. That is right. that is who you are. So this question of erasing erasing your past deeds or where you come from, that you're essentially erasing yourself. Has it, you know, obviously this similar trope in the Great Gatsby, but Great Gatsby is like a very, very different story I know. to this. I do so I think ways. it's a yeah, I think it's a kind of a parallel that I think yeah. our Cod and Gatsby are kind of the same the same story, although our, it's what's interesting is Arkadin wants to erase his past for his daughter mm -hmm. and Gatsby for his girlfriend, right? Girlfriend. Like, so it's a slightly different, but I think, I think you're right. That's exactly the thing that I, I mean, I love Gatsby too. It's one of my favorite novels. So I have a clear, there's something I, maybe my own past, I wish I could erase and I, I haven't been able to. I also think it's great that it's, it's, I think it functions really well as a sort of like a, a repression of black. Because basically, when Stratton approaches Mr. Rakadin, he basically tells him that he has a sort of like paper on him, right, of, of, his, of his history and things that he's done wrong or, or illegal. And then he tells him, it's just like, well, what if I would get one on you? And that starts basically the whole thing. But it reminds me of this, this thing that Freud said, that repression isn't just that. It's also the repression of repression, or that that's primarily why it is. And I, I like this idea of just like going back into your history that you pretend not to remember, um, just so that you can sort of like put away sort of like your subjective lack. I, I think that's a perfectly put. Yeah, I love that idea that that repression is the repression of lack. More maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's just that's it as such, right? Like that's what repression is. And I think you're right that repressing the past in the case of Arkadin is precisely repressing his own lack. And that's, you know, I also, I also think that there's a link between this film and the stru and this is true of Gatsby too, the structure of capital, right? Like you, like, like what Marx calls primitive accumulation, like that's what has to be repressed for the capitalist process to go on. And so I think the fact that Arkadin is this wealthy guy is not surprising. It fits in with that. Yeah, that's right. Should we go to high and low? Yeah, I'm just gonna zoom on through the last two. <laughs> so we can at least get like 120 or something like that. Uh, yeah, let's go to high and low. 
Yeah, this is another, uh, so this is Akira Kurosawa film, and I think is his high point, mm -hmm. even though I love Akuru and, and other ones. But um, what I love about this film is that it, it, so first of all, it's about the kidnapping of a, the servant of a wealthy man. And, and then the wealthy man has this moral dilemma of, do I pay the ransom for this servant's son when I would have paid it for my son? And he ends up doing it, but they get the police involved and it kind of goes awry, but it finally ends up fine. And there's a way in which this is kind of like M because the guy who is, who perpetuates the kidnapping is caught in the end. And the final scene of the film is this interrogation between the guy who pays the ransom, the owner of this, or this executive at a shoe factory and, and the criminal. And we see him in the, and the criminal finally just breaks down and, and is shattered. And then the film ends. So I, but what I love about the film, I, I should get straight to that, is that it, it's, it, to me, it's one of the best films about class division that I think I've ever seen. That it, and, it, and it does it through the way, it does it through its, the way it depicts geography. So the, and, and through what's visible. So the, the rich shoe executive lives on top of a house. I mean, sorry, on top of a mountain, his house on top of a mountain. And it looks down all over the whole town and through this kind of slummy area and that's where this medical student who perpetuates the kidnapping lives and so and when the police are doing the investigation they kind of map out the the city and you can see the way in which the class is written onto the the class relations are written onto the space in the film and i i think that's and even the space within the house has the same kind of class relations because the servant is always is always kind of down from the the, the executive and and so it's really to me it's one of the most amazing uses of just spaces in film to make a theoretical point yeah parasite oh, parasite i wonder yeah how much how much it got from this this movie right yeah. right right it's you're right parasite's kind of a sequel in some ways too yeah it. did you did you enjoy parasite i love parasite yeah yeah one thing i love about parasite just to not to go on too much of a tangent is the way it shows the divide within the working class right yeah, like, absolutely. like there's not just this one there's like even a divide within what we think is just the one class so i love yeah. that yeah i haven't been able to get too much into kurosawa uh, i tried watching uh seven samurai and i just uh, uh it was really my cup of tea Oh, I have to say, I find it quite difficult to watch as well. I just annoy ah, so. But this is a high and low is, is sort of a non-Kurosawa kind of yeah. Kurosawa film because it's it's contemporary, right? It's like not mm -hmm. the not a samurai film. But I uh, I don't know. I've I've taught it quite a few times, and students really like it. Like they, I, I I've had students have trouble. I used to teach Rashomon or Seven Samurai. And students thought, of course, Seven Samurai was way too long. Uh, and Rashomon, they just thought was too much of a theoretical exercise and not yeah. enough of a film. Uh, but this one, I think they all really were into because of this class dynamic that it shows really. It does, it does yeah. feel more, I don't know, for want of a better word, Western. Um, you know, it, it's got more of a genre feel to it. And I don't know, I and mean, it is interesting, it's, it's more present day and things like that. But yeah, the, the other, yeah, it's, I have to say, I agree with it. I mean, I do enjoy, I really enjoy watching Kurosawa, but like Rashomon and stuff. I, it's such a different, um, even like way of acting, things like that. Right, right, right. It is a totally different style of acting than Western acting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, yeah, but this, yeah, the, I don't know. The, I, I can see the other films appeal, but this one for me is just the really the high point. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But I, 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 yeah, I do kind of think it's the acting because it's, it's very over the top and it's kind of, I was I watched Seven Samurai thinking that it would be like a very sort of like serious serious film and maybe it was a mistake that I watched Three Amigos before that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, but I just thought it was like a little bit more comedy than anything else. Right? Yeah, no, I mean all of his films have that comic dimension. I think it's related to the acting, right? Like the the ex excessive acting is has this comic dimension to it always has it always a kind of medieval feel i sometimes feel i don't know what like i imagine it was like going to the theater in medieval times i don't know just uh it is different i i'm i'm very into like the non-acting acting you know so. right 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 <laughs> ryan gosling bland face <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's interesting is that, you know, to, to connect the other film that we saw, like Wells also acts that same way, right? Yeah. Like, it's very, 
it's interesting to me that in, in Wells thought this was Wells thought that Cagney was the greatest actor in the world because he could act like he did on stage mm -hmm. in a film. Okay. And I think that's it's almost impossible. And Wells did the same thing. So it's a yeah. very big kind of performance. And I think Kurosawa's actors do the kind of do the same thing. Like it's a it's as if they're acting on stage, but they're acting in film. And I think it's it can be hard to pull off, but I think it's effective in certain in certain instances, I think it really works. It's true. I have to say that the mode of acting I really don't like is a sort of muted but excessive muted, where it's kind of like really just there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't find it well, too can much. I... Sometimes what like is taught to act it, well, I, I've seen it be, um, you know, as if it's something to aim for to direct actors in that way, but I don't like that at all. But it was funny, last week we did an episode on The Devil Probably, and the act is just kind of so reduced. It's almost like da, da, right, right, da, 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 da. right. No, I, I mean, I obviously prefer I prefer that too. But I think it. Well, I with you, what I don't, I I have to confess this that my one of my least favorite actors is Meryl Streep because yeah, okay. it's always this like I'm putting on a great performance. I'm yeah, always yeah. kind of so I feel like she's. I think she's a great emoter, not a great actor. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, so yeah. Yeah, I've never gotten the whole thing about Meryl Streep. I, I've never thought she was like that that great. Uh, We're talking yeah, about, right. you know, like the, the the mob or group being right. It is interesting uh, when a person or an individual takes on this kind of like mascot-like treasure role. I mean, in the UK, we have this term national treasure. I don't know if you have that in the in the. Yeah, US. we do have that. Yeah, And it's kind of quite hard to like work out what makes that or what makes kind of an un- criticable person or something or what yeah well, well i think it ties to actually what adrian was saying before about the repression of lack right like isn't the the national treasure is a non-lacking subject and i think like our two here i think are tom hanks and meryl streep and they're both they both most of their roles are i'm a non like i'm a i'm upright yeah. I'm a perfectly non-lacking. So I don't have any sexual desires. Yeah. I don't try to, I don't want to kill anyone. I'm just an upright person. And I feel like that what they're saying is I'm a non-lacking subject, right? Like that's, and right. so I feel like that's what, to me, that's the definition of the national treasure is that, oh, we found someone that we can make a non-lacking subject and then we can identify the nation with them. So my side, do I do kind of feel that that Tom Hanks sort of like broke his lifelong character when he didn't laugh at Ricky Gervais jokes and I mean not that I think um, I'm not a big fan of Ricky Gervais but he kind of reminded me of like when uh, who was the guy that it was like Obama and Trump were in the in some kind of dinner and they were doing like like uh, comedy and yeah it's called the, Trump, the, the correspondence dinner like correspondence dinner and Trump was just like not laughing at all and Tom Hanks sort of like reminded me of that it, it, I think it would have been more congruent for him to just like have a laugh even if he didn't think it was funny yeah continue yeah, yeah. To continue of like his thing, you know? I think that's pretty good I uh I I think that the to me the 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 perfect thing about Hanks is that you know that those that series of books Da Vinci Code etc that he or he plays right. yeah. to yeah uh What's interesting is it's the only case, I think, where there's sex in the novel and yeah. then they take it out for the film. So oh. it's like, what what in the world is happening? Unless you have a totally non-sexualized, non-lacking actor playing the part, I guess, you know? Right, yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Should we go to um, Three Days of the Condor? Yeah. So Three Days of the Condor. So this is uh, Robert Redford, Faye Dunaway. And he plays a CIA agent. He's not actually, an, he's kind of an agent. He, he reads books for the CIA and he uncovers a plot within the CIA to invade the Middle East. And he reports it. And then all the people at his agency get, or his station get killed when he's out to lunch. So he's not killed. And then he's on the run throughout the film. And I love this guy, this, this idea of, I love these 70s uh, paranoid thrillers like Parallax View, Three Days of the Condor. Yeah. I think they're all really great. And I think Running what's- Running Man. What's that? Running Man. Running, well, Running Man's 80s, but same right. kind of yeah. same kind of idea. Uh, uh, but I love this idea of the, of the way in which the structure, the system is, has these internal fissures within it, the CIA, in which it's actually 
at odds with itself at points and it doesn't know what it wants to do. And I think that's one of the great things about this film because I think so many films portray secret services as all knowing. And this is a point at which they don't even know what their own people are doing. And then Robert Redford kind of gets caught up in the middle of that. But I, and then I, I love the way in which he's, I think his position at the end of the film is really a great ethical position because he's totally, he, he gives his story about this whole thing to the New York Times and then the head of the CIA or the, one of the representatives says, okay, how do you know they're going to print it? And, he, and then Redford starts to walk away and the guy goes, you can take a walk, but how far can you go if they don't print it? And I just, I love that idea that he's completely, he has no more symbolic community that he belongs to. He's just completely on his own because he just, because he he tried to take a stand and then that's what happened to him. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I meant uh, Marathon Man, not running. Oh, Marathon, <laughs> not, yes, uh, of course, Marathon yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that is 70s and that's a paranoid thriller, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think, what do you, what have you thought about Robert Redford's like last last films? He did one where he was just like alone in a in a boat or something. I think it, oh, it might have yeah, been yeah, called like all the thing. I think it's called is All Is Lost. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, is he still involved in that that whole like Tribeca thing? And I think so. Because he, yeah, because yeah, he, he had like a festival or something. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think he still does. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I kind of like Redford as a figure, as an actor. Yeah. I, think <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much it has to do with the characters he plays. Like, I, yeah, I know. I, spy game. <laughs> I know. I know. I always kind of go for those. But uh, yeah, even all the president's men, I kind of have a soft spot for. But yeah, oh I my think. God. He, that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've seen that film. About, I've seen Three Days of the Condor. Uh, good 25 times but also all the president's men so i feel like i have an intimate relationship to robert redford uh but i i people it's funny because i've showed this film to my class and people think they don't they they characterize so he has sex with faye dunaway character and and he has a gun when they start to they start to get involved with each other and and she's he's kidnapped her Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. people my students were like, this is a rape scene, and it, but the film doesn't portray it as a rape. It's really, yeah. so it's interesting. Uh, and then somebody else in the class said, well, but it's Robert Redford, so you know he's not gonna hurt you. So that, t- I think it's interesting that it ties to, <laughs> uh, it ties to what you were saying that, that there is something about Robert Redford that kind of is, is makes, that his presence is felt in this film, I think. Yeah, it, if it was somebody else, I'm not sure that it would work too well. You know, the, the the, I'm really. The, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say I'm really glad that you brought up rape because it reminded me of this thing that you <laughs> said about. Um, okay, so you said that the the new Blade Runner 2049 is better than the one from the 80s, and um, you said that. Well, one of the points that you made is that basically it has a rape scene, and I wanted to sort of talk about that just a little bit because. One, don't you think that maybe it's putting into question the fact that, okay, so there's this there's this rape scene, but what is rape when there is, when when it involves a sort of like a replicant rather right. than another human being? And the other thing is, I it, you don't strike me as a type of person that needs th- their films to be virtuous or moral. No, 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 no. No, I I don't know I. My main reason for saying the later one is better is just theoretical. It's not mm-hmm. that. Yeah. But, um, okay. but, but I, 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 I think I just threw that in as a kind of like a pot yeah. chat. Um, <laughs> because I, I mean, right. I mean, I think you're right that there is a lot that, that, that scene is questionable, right? Like it's, right. and it's funny because I've showed that film to my classes and they have had no problem with it. So it's funny that they objected to Three Days of the Condor and not Blade Runner because Blade Runner is more vi- I mean that scene is more it's more physically use of physical violence and right. I think you know I mean I guess the argument would be that she needs because she's a she's been programmed in a certain way she needs to be kind of jolted out of her programming but if, I mean I don't know I feel like that's problematic in its way but you're right like like I think a film can have a scene that I find upsetting and not and not, I don't won't dismiss the film for that reason yeah I just I was, I, 
I have to say, I just love the later Blade Runner because I think I wrote in this article that it it shows the conflict between uh, capitalism and the and the police. And mm -hmm. I, 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 in fact, I don't know that there's a better film about depicting yeah. the way in which the nation and the police can be at odds with the with capital. Because I think you know the Marxist idea is that the police just follow from the interests of capital. Mm -hmm. And I think Blade Runner the 2049 shows how they're really you know, never in lockstep with each other. And I think that, I, I mean, I'm almost tempted to say that the, these Black Lives Matter protests show it too. Like, I think the look at how capital is like, oh, we'll put Black Lives Matter signs up everywhere and the police are not following along with that. So I think there's this in, in kind of antagonism within the socioeconomic structure. And I think Blade Runner 2049 shows that in a great way. But but I don't want to, I mean, I, I kind of think, I actually almost put Blade Runner as my favorite film from the 80s, because I think, I think the original Blade Runner is a, one of the greatest films about the nature of subjectivity, right? Like, right. like, like your, your, and it comes back to this whole fake real thing too, right? Like, like it's about Deckard as a replicant, I think, and his, you know, his discovery of, of how he can be a subject, even though he's been created by someone else. Mm -hmm. I was listening to this conversation between Brett Easton Ellis and Chuck Palahniuk, and basically they were talking about how millennials are sort of like they have this sort of puritanical edge to them that it's they need sort of what they consume the narrative to be sort of like morally correct. Uh, I was I was listening to this, but I've told this to Helen before. This this podcast that talks about video games, and there's basically this uh, this bestseller video game that came out recently it, but it's based, it's horror it's about a zombie sort of outbreak and uh, one of the guys that was like reviewing the game on the podcast was saying that uh, he he didn't like that he was forced to kill people on the video game uh, that he that he prefers to go through a video game without having to kill anyone so he'll stealthily sort of like escape at any moment where he wants to kill someone or where he has to kill someone and Chuck Palahniuk in this conversation said that, well, millennials sort of, um, they've been sort of bombarded with so many images of excessive violence and uh, so much explicit content that they just kind of like, they need to retreat and sort of like they want this, this sort of like more mild uh, sort of, sort of, sort of uh, narrative. Do you think that there's something wrong or I don't know. Uh, do we miss something by not being exposed to, or or by thinking that vir morally virtuous sort of stories or media in general? Um, do we miss something by having that that sort of like excess? And is it something that's necessary? I mean, what do you think about this sort of like millennial sort of like puritanical position? Yeah, is it? Yeah, I, I mean, it's interesting because I you know I teach film classes to these people all the to, to millennials mostly and. And I have to say, I don't get that much of that response. Like most of the time it's, it's pretty like the, I haven't noticed another, I guess I should say this. I haven't noticed that much of a change in the 20 some years I've been teaching. So I don't know. Right. I mean, I, I do, I do see this kind of thing, obviously wider in the culture. Um, I don't know. Like, is there something like I had a student last semester, I think a couple semesters ago say this film is too, Oh, it's interesting. It's about fight club. A student right. wouldn't said, I, I don't feel like I, they started to watch Fight Club, they walked out. And then they said later to me, they said, you should have given us a warning about Fight Club because it was just too violent. And then I thought, well, that's strange. Like it's not, I wouldn't even think Fight Club is that yeah, violent. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so occasionally that'll happen. And I think if it causes you to miss Fight Club, then I think that's regrettable. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. I don't, I mean, I think recoiling from, graphic things is probably a good thing i don't know like uh you know i don't i don't i don't necessarily think that that i, I mean i think that's what polonik was kind of saying right like there's this you're bombarded with so much you just recoil i don't i mean that's not my way i tend to like although i can't watch horror films and if someone forced me to watch a horror film i would be like i did a thing on annihilation for you guys that's about far as i go down the horror. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as far as i go Go ahead. So I was going to say about, you know, well, from his perspective, he's saying that millennials are inherently conservative, you know, to retreat from graphic. And I mean, I think that the, the moralism is a conservative move, you know, 
Um, but it's just, it's just weird because I feel like as soon as it, we, we talked about this, we, we did an episode about the Athlete A documentary, the documentary about the uh, US gymnastics uh, sexual abuse scandal right. and how the, the documentary was interesting and it, like, it really identified what the issues were. It talked actually quite structurally and then suddenly halfway through it flips it. It almost does the opposite of what M does and it becomes like extremely moralistic. And as soon as you become moralistic, I mean, that's just not the universalist position at all. But right. just talking, going back to a point about like the police and capital, it is just interesting because this moralism ties in that, I, I mean, I see quite a lot with you know, what the contours of this moral perspective are in terms of, I think, what he's talking about with millennials. Like for me, all these institutions that in 68 potentially were identified as the cudgels of capital, to me, it's like so much more ambivalent than that. Like the family, for instance, like, I think there's a dimension of the family being a defense against capital and the capital wants us to be particularized. So it's just interesting that like, in terms of the, this moral perspective being conservative, well, conservative, capitalistic conservative. I think all of these terms just, I have no idea what any of them mean anymore. Right, right. Like conservative no, but, sounds but, like but, less but, capitalistic, but yeah. Right, right. I mean, I think you're right that there is a way in which that kind of moralizing position fits pretty well within the capitalist universe, right? Yeah, like that, yeah. I think that's yeah. true, yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, should we go to Paris, Texas? Yeah, I've been there actually. Have you? What's that? Nothing much is there, no. no. Uh, yeah. So Paris, Texas is a Vim Benders film, uh, made 1984, and it depicts a guy who just, the film starts with him just alone walking out in the desert, and he's, his life is in ruins, and then he kind of picks everything, but he, he finds his child in California, then comes back to visit the wife that he left behind, who's now working in a it's not a strip, I guess it's kind it's of a strip club. Show. It's a peep show, yeah, thank you, Adrian. Uh, and, and then I, I think two of these, there's these two amazing scenes where he goes into the peep show uh, to see her and she doesn't know who he is and you see her slowly figuring out who he is and then there's a moment yeah. where, and he's, he's describing himself and his life to her and and she, when the moment when she discovers who he is, it's just amazing. And they never actually see each other except at a, at a distance or through this peep show, uh, one way mirror kind of screen. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know, I feel like that, it's, it's one of these moments where it's, the, the, it's almost the opposite of, the, of, of our cotton because the guy starts as a blank screen for us as spectators. And then we, we get the back story filled in Mm -hmm. And the, so mm -hmm. we get this kind of, we get, you kind of like him in the beginning and then you, all of a sudden you learn all this stuff about him and you, and, and so you're, you realize that he's very compromised. And, yeah. and then, so he ends up, he ends up on his own, just alone. And, and I, again, it's kind of in that way, it's like three days of the condor that it's about the isolation of this guy who just can't, you know, he tries to, in, all he can do really is get the mother and child back together. Like he can't be part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also love this sort of like redoubling of, of hiding where he knows that she can't see him. Travis knows that uh, Jane can't see him. And, but he still turns away yeah. to be able to yeah. tell his story. And it's almost yeah. like he needs that sort of like double protection. Yeah. Um, yeah it's like, it reminds me of uh, something my mom used to do. Cause my mom is like, I think a little bit parent <laughs> she's always been so uh, and sometimes she would make a phone call and then she would hang up visibly like press the red button or whatever and then after hanging up she would be like you know be quiet you can't talk too loud because what if the call didn't really hang up and they could still hear and I, I love that just like yeah this sort of like you, you need to beyond security you need to sort of like act a certain way in order right. to like avoid what you're fearing yeah. right plus he can't look at her right like i mean I, I think in order to tell the story he can't stand to look at her and I, so it, it's mm -hmm. again that just like you're saying that level of protection for himself is the is the key for him to be able to reveal him and and i think it's i always have thought of that those two scenes as like psychoanalytic sessions you know and like he's because and and, and it's important in psychoanalysis too that you're not looking at the analyst right. and so he i think he does he puts it he's almost like laying back on the analyst's couch 
as he's uh, as he's describing his life. And I, I, I don't know. I just think the revelations of that scene and and the fact that vendors would locate it in a peep show, I think is this great. It's just an amazing idea that 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 it's actually because who's being exposed? You know, we always think the peep show is the woman being exposed, but and but what really is exposed is the man who goes to that. And and I think that's what vendors in a way kind of literalizes that that the guy exposes himself to her even though she's the only one that can be seen yeah mm -hmm. and also i think it's interesting that what he's escaping is isn't just being seen but also being heard or, or right. speaking because he right. he also tells her that he wants to go to a place that is without language and without yeah. streets and what i what i understand from the fact that he says with without any streets is that if you go to a street basically your orientation is to the language as well because every street has a name um, so yeah, what do you, what do you make of that? The fact that he, when his brother picks him up, he basically doesn't want to speak at all. He's just right. Like, I think, I think he's yeah. trying to, I think he, he's like in a position of symbolic death, right? Like that's what you're saying. And I think that's exactly right. Like outside of the linguistic orientation and he wants to get outside of that symbolic structure. And, and the film is kind of like him reestablishing himself within the symbolic universe. So it's interesting because like, I think we usually, most films that talk, that include some kind of symbolic death, they end with it, right? Like, they, mm -hmm. like that's what, that's the situation of Redford at the end of Three Days of the Condor, Joe Turner. And that's the situation of Arkadin at the end of Mr. Arkadin, although he's jumped out of his plane, I think. So he's actually dead. Um, but, but, uh, this is a case where you see a person's subjectivity being rebuilt mm -hmm. after that moment of symbolic death. And I don't know, I can't think of another film that does that. We were talking about Two Days, One Night last week, and I kind of think it does that. It does I, that too. You're right. You're actually, right. I kind of think, weirdly, the, the short film that we just did is sort of about, like, as we're talking, we actually have talked about Morning and Melancholia a lot, about, like, how both states are to do with, like, a, a tear. Right. Uh, well, mourning needs to be reinstated, like, yeah, some new kind of symbolic orientation with the world. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. no, I think Two Days, One Night weirdly does. There's, a, there's another French movie that also begins with something like a blank state, a blank slate, that then gets, um, you know, the narrative gets reconstructed towards the end. It's called uh, I've Loved You So Long. Oh, that's a, uh, I love that film. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, that came out in the same year as a, uh, uh, tell no one you know this yeah, uh, yeah, no yeah. idea person yeah. uh both with Kristen scott thomas but i i love you're right that tell, i loved you for so long is 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 really about how she can reconstruct after she's done this it's interesting because we think it's such a horrific thing yeah it's really not but then we th it, yeah. then it becomes kind of heroic what she yeah. did yeah you know so i think it's it's interesting yeah uh one of the things that um because i also read an essay by you for that you that you did on Paris, Texas, and one of the things that you talked about was that he basically is living out of pure desire without fantasy, because in the way that Lacan talks about fantasy is that it's a setting. So the way that he he sort of like I think wants to inhabit this place that is without signifiers. Right. Uh, he doesn't want anything to get in the way of like his sort of like just like pure drive to like perpetually escape wherever he is so he, he's like it's so funny that he it just starts with him just like walking in the desert um but yeah i just i i really like that detail of uh, of fantasy that that you make yeah and then then so then the the encounter the, then i love the fact that vendors makes this encounter with the fantasy world that occurs in the peep show right like he avoids fantasy altogether until these moment of this traumatic encounter with it yeah. What do you think happened to the character, Travis, after he reunited the mother and the son? Did he just continue to, like, Rolling Stone or whatever? Yeah, it's a good, maybe he went walking in the desert again or something. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I think, yeah, I mean, I think there's a way maybe he's able to start his life up over again, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think that's a possibility for him. Like, I think yeah. we don't know, but I think that's a possibility. Yeah. Should we go to Fight Club? Sure. <laughs> So Fight Club, <laughs> uh, I think Fight Club, so uh, this friend of mine, uh, Anna Kornblue, just wrote a really good book. I want to pimp it a little bit. It's called uh, Marxist Film Theory and Fight Club. Uh, but but I think, I don't know that there's a better film that connects 
I keep saying, this is the best film that does this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I don't know if there's a better film that connects um, individual psychic self undoing to collective action. Mm -hmm. Like I think that's what the main idea of Fight Club is, is to see how my, I, can, I can get out of, like it's about escaping the way in which capital has this control over me individually in my psyche how I can connect and then I can connect that to some kind of collective act. And so I think that's really what's going on. Sorry, what's going on in Fight Club. And I, I, I think that, that I don't know. And, and Fincher really departed, I think, in some important ways from the novel to do that. And I think, but I think it's the height of Fincher, who I think is a really good director. And I think it's, it's just really one of the most politically savvy films I've ever seen, which is interesting because I think a lot of people, thought of it as fascistic when it came out. You know, they were really suspicious of it. Did you see that David Fincher's next film is gonna be on, the, I forgot his name, but the writer of Citizen Kane and sort of like all of the difficulty that he went through when he when he was gonna direct that film? I mean, the, Orson Welles. Oh, really? It's about Orson Welles? I mean, it's about the writer and then Orson Welles, I guess, comes into the picture. So Herman well, Mankiewicz was the writer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it's called Mank. Oh, movie. Mank. Okay, good. I, I didn't know anything about that. So I'll, be, I'll love to see that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, did, Alan, did you have I was going to say, I don't know if I remember this correctly, but I remember like listening to it, she Shake talk about Fight Club and the idea of like harming the self or injuring the self before the system. And I can't remember what, I really can't remember what the point was, but I think this is the idea of well, like- No, that is the point. It. Right. That is the point, right? Like okay. that your, your self- harm mm -hmm. is the basis for your ability to challenge the structure. And he, he yeah. loves that. And I, I, I show this scene to my students all the time. The scene where Edward Norton, his boss is about ready to fire him. Edward Norton beats himself up and then yeah. he gets whatever he wants from the boss. So yeah. there's a way in which that, I really like that idea that the self harm is the basis for emancipation in the larger yeah. political sense. Well, it's interesting, like the dialectics of that, because almost being a participant in the capitalistic system is pure self-harm. So right. yeah, that self, you can actually recognize the self-harm in one direction, and then actually what is perhaps more clearly recognize the self-harm isn't quite so daunting. Well, isn't it, I think that's a great point. And isn't it like that, that rather than letting capital harm you, exactly. you're going to actually harm, your, you're going to be the yeah. subject that harms Absolutely. yourself. Yeah. yeah. I also feel like psychoanalysis is, is a good example of that because yeah. what you do analysis is uh, you basically, I mean, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's been the same for you, Helen, but like the way that psychoanalysis started for me was basically sort of like confessional, almost religious. Like you go and you confess your sins and you like confess your, your darkest secrets and you go on from there but that you first have to go through that process of just yeah. like self-harm and like putting yourself out there in shame and then that starts to like matter less and less did you find the first but, i've just done six months and i i have to say if the six months has been quite difficult but actually my yeah. this has gone on holiday and we reached a point where like it was basically said like right now we've worked out what your structure is now we're gonna do this <laughs> so it's like yeah. thank god but yeah there is a kind of like it's not easy yeah well i have fun yeah yeah <laughs> i mean my my psychologist would never tell me my structure <laughs> i've asked yeah. him a couple of times already I, I, he I, has he not said <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um yeah i mean fight club is just it's, it's so great and um if you want to know more about what Todd thinks about it, I mean, you have a, you have a, you have a, a couple of great essays on it. So um, we're, we're kind of running pretty long here. Should we go to Lost in Translation? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I think uh, Lost in Translation is one of my favorite moments in cinema. It's the moment where it's the end toward the, maybe it's the very last scene of the film. I think it is uh, where the Bill Murray character in the scar, he, he, they say goodbye and then he's driving away and then he sees her again and he runs up to her, calls for her, and then he whispers something into her ear. And we see we see his mouth moving and we can kind of hear something, but we don't hear what it is. And I think there's this moment where what he's saying to her is really nothing. And it's the form of the saying it that matters. And I I, I just love that idea that that it's this 
the form of the communication that means something, not what's communicated. And so I feel like that, and I think this idea of the nothing that's at the heart of things is, is present throughout that film. And I, I kind of love that when he, when they go to Japan, they're both, he's working in Japan, she's vacationing. Uh, and that what they see is, is him basically. Like when, whenever they go to look for the heart of Japan, they see this Bill Murray on an ad or something. And so I think it's one of these great moments where the, that it's really about the universal in the sense that there's that there's at the heart of every culture is this nothing, this mm -hmm. gap, this empty space, and that's what allows the cultures to communicate with each other. So I think that I find it really one of the great films about universality, in you know in this in the guise of a kind of culture crash because culture clash because there are these moments where and the film even plays them for laughs when there's a kind of miscommunication. Like there's a point where the translator translates a long bit of dialogue and says like two words and Bill yeah. Murray, and then Bill Murray says, is that all he said? And, and it's kind of funny, but the point is that there, that really what's, what connects them is what's missing and not, and this is also what connects Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson character as well. So their bond is over what's missing. It's not romantic, which is kind of fascinating that it's, that, 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 and I think it's important that it's a woman director probably that she, she flirts with this idea that it could be a romance. And there's even one moment where you think they've slept together. And then it turns mm -hmm. out he's just gone to bed with the, uh, the nightclub singer at the hotel. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just purely sexual tension. And, but it's also like this, this uh, it, it, it articulates the, this whole thing of like the uh, relationships are basically impossible. Right, that, right. But the, right, but out of that, like in that impossibility, that's yeah. where you get the real bond between. Yeah. I mean, like, isn't it one of the great friend depictions friendship. of friendship? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just, I really think it is like how how, you know, what do they have in common really? Like, mm -hmm. it's not even clear. They don't talk about anything, but it's a great depiction of friendship. I think it's interesting. You know, the, the film is like the opposite of Orientalism almost. And talking because I think I mentioned Bart before. The uh, he wrote a book. About Japan, the empire of signs. And then I kind of think it's just the idea of like lost in translation, the idea of like translation, like translation is an art because it's impossible because of the gap that's inherent in language. And I, it's funny because I actually did like, this is like college reading, I did like a, a whole dissertation and I think like the empire of signs like they played a big role in it and I can't really remember. But yeah, I guess it's just this idea that, you know, Japan ha has this, and I guess, you know, different Asian cultures in the past, let's say this, this magical promise for a lot of people through these kind of uh, various cultural um, artifacts and practices. And yeah, but this film really re reveals that it's just, as you say, a, an ad of Bill Murray at the heart of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's one of the, I think the way you put it is great. It's one of the great anti-Orientalist films. It's funny because, uh, there was a campaign against it. I talk about this in my yeah. essay I wrote on it that called trying to get it to not win an Oscar called Lost in Racism. Yeah. And I think I, I just I, I, I'm just befuddled by the fact that that could ever have happened. But, yeah. um, but I feel a little bad. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I was going to say the racists are the one who, ones who want to particularize a given culture. You know? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. And we were going to say we talked a little bit about the book. Uh, uh, was it White Fragility? The other, you know, and it's like, it's like, well, you know, and I also, you know, now we have this flat, obviously there's all these important uh, movements, but then like how certain things can be, you know, weaponized or taken as sort of this position is the, is the universal and everybody else is a particular. And I just think it's quite interesting that that book is just like really racist, you know? Right, 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 right. Uh, <laughs> no, so yeah, the way that you're talking about it, it's, it's, it's a very sort of like Hegelian film then, because I mean, uh, Zizek talks about this a lot, basically, and like sort of like the ontological incompleteness is what sort of like, that's the universal. And um, yeah, it's, it, it, it kind of seems to me that maybe the antithesis of Lost in Translation would be Villeneuve's uh, Arrival, because what happens uh, in Arrival is that they're giving some, given something new, which is sort of like these, this like anachronistic uh, language. Right. that changes their subjectivity but it's something that they didn't have before and that allows 
governments to sort of like cooperate and everything. And and with this, it's different. It's just like you already have it. Uh, it it's it's this lag. It's this un ontology. Yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. Thing. No, that's great. I never thought of it in those terms, but that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little can um, talking about retrospectively things becoming true, <laughs> actually. Um, and uh, Adrian also worked on this film. We made a film, was, we made it ages ago, but we kind of like re redid it. It's about a little boy who runs out, runs away to Jamaica, but essentially it's the same kind of idea that there's nothing there, this promise of this magical land in yeah. the 60s and all the money he wants to run away to. But there's a quote from, from Lacan that I retrospectively chose to put at the front of it. What is it like, um, an object caught in the net of shadow? Do you know this one? Um, I so, don't know. But... Oh god, I'll have to. I'll have to remember. It's like basically. Oh god, I can't even remember the quote. I should have thought about it in advance because it really encapsulates everything to do with uh, with uh, lost in translation. It's just basically yeah. like the shadow of the shadow of the object that isn't really there that kind of like captures you in this kind of um, yeah. I'll have to remember it and send it to you. It really send it to me. Yeah, for sure. Of, uh, yeah. of uh, lost in translation. Yeah. Yeah. Should we go to a certified copy? Yeah, the last one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I've, I've, it's another film I just, I, I've, I love Kiarostami and this was his, um, I shouldn't probably pick a Kiarostami film that wasn't made in Iran, but <laughs> it was the one that I, I got to this, this decade. And so I, that's how it fit out. But um, I, I think uh, certified copy or copy conform, the French title is, uh, I, I guess for me, what it does is comes back to this question that we we're talking about earlier about the way in which the copy and the original, they get mixed up and you don't know. And what this, this does it in terms of a relationship where you don't know, it's unclear really if the Juliet Binoche character and the writer, are they, is this the first, are they just meeting or are they married? And then the kind of the, the it, be, it seems to like they begin as relative strangers and then they become a, it becomes true that they were always a couple at the end. So, and then, and then as that happens, what becomes apparent as well is this antagonism between them that undermines, you were just saying the impossibility of the relationship. This to me is one of the great films about the impossibility of the sexual relationship because we see the way in which the, every, every, time they think they can get together something kind of drives them apart and i i think it filmically is so nice there's this one scene at a fountain mm -hmm. and it, it's so beautifully depicted the way in which they can't their inability to get together and we see the fountain come between them and i i don't know i feel like that's one of the best visual depictions of this impossibility it's so clever. It's so it actually reminds me a little bit in a different way of arrival and like how clever the screenplay is, you know, just how Well that's how right, because you don't know I think it's exactly like arrival because yeah. you don't know you think in arrival her daughter is already dead yeah. at the beginning when she's just she's just depressive, right? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh so yeah, yeah. So yeah arrival I have to say yeah. so clever. But yeah, this everything, you know, form and function are intertwined so much in this film, which is almost like a question of the whole film itself, you know, like what's real, what's 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 like an artifice of the actual cultural product, or you know, it, you know, everything everything is reflected in everything. You know, the the book he's writing about, what he's writing about in the book, the film itself, the structure of the film, you know, the relationship. Right. It's uh, right. all the it's shot, real, know, really clever. It's a real mise on a beam, right? Like you can yeah. never get to the starting point. I think Absolutely. that's, I mean, that's true of a lot of Kiarostami, but I think this is actually the point at which it, he, he realizes that logic to its height. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really good. The, uh, also, I mean, it's interesting that language plays quite a big role in a lot of the films that you selected. I, I think film as in the spoken language is an interesting thing to play with in film itself. And I think it speaks to the kind of the universality of film because you can just like literally whip out any language and it's, you know, totally well, right. in this, yeah. Plus in this language, they're using, they're, they're like what language they're speaking is incredibly yeah. significant, I yeah. think, right? Like that, yeah, like he understands and speaks French and they speak a little Italian, but, and, and primarily English, but, but that, like it's, are we on her turf when we're speaking French? Like there's all these questions, I think. And, and they're in, like, even though they can understand each other in all the languages, there's still like the barrier of the language is, is still there in terms of the multiplicity of it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, and it gets revealed where she misunderstands the um, bar tender misunderstands their relationship. Well, misunderstands their relationship for a marriage in, in the language that only the only language that he can't understand of all the three that's used. Yeah, right. and he's not even an act actor. I don't think. I think this is like his first acting role. I think that's right. I yeah, think that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, it was really. I I don't really. What was it, the name of the director again? I I don't think it's I. It's Abbas Kiristami. He's an Iranian. Yeah. He died uh, about four years ago, five mm -hmm. years ago. But he's a, he was like the great it, d Iranian director of their new wave of directors. Yeah. And now, and now there are other guys that have kind of come along, like the guy that, um, uh, Oscar Farhadi, the guy that did uh, Salesman and Separation, and, uh, and this great recent film uh, with uh, Penelope Cruz and. Javier Bardem called Everybody Knows. It's a oh, it's a Spanish right. film. Yeah. yeah. So he another Iranian director who came to Europe to make, you know, because they want to. I think they want to get out of the censorship, and so yeah. they come. Yeah. Absolutely. But it, but it, but I have to say that the censorship. It's, it's I I love this idea that the censorship can be productive because you know isn't there a way in which even certified copy, even though it's made in the West, and yeah. it's kind of like there's a censor. Forcing yeah. them to do to not show directly certain things. I, think. I know. I sometimes think about like this dystopian future and authoritarian whatever that awaits us. I'm like, oh well, what are we going to do about art? But actually, I almost think that I censor myself more now than possibly I could in any other situation. Uh, and like, I think, yeah. No, it's. I think it's absolutely true. I mean, think. I do think there have been great films made subsequently, but don't you think that, like, the average film. Mm -hmm. under the censorship in Hollywood, which is better than yeah. the average film afterward. And I think yeah. it's because they had the censorship. It's interesting. I know, I know. And it is weird, like what constant, because yeah, as I say, I, I feel like, well, maybe it's not, it's not a censorship as such now, but there's almost a thing of like, if you point too closely, if you, if you show the universal too much, it can't be dealt with in this like free market, you know? And it, so right. it really, so I wouldn't self send. Well, I, I don't know. But yeah, there, there's almost like a push towards the particular, which I think makes essentially makes bad films. But right. Well, I think that's isn't that's, that's the capitalist that's the capitalist drive, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, thanks so much, Todd. <laughs> oh, just, thank you guys. Box, this is really fun. Yeah. This is really no, fun. Great. Um, okay. We always end up like talking about each individual film for so long. Like anytime we do anything, it's not like one film for a whole episode. Uh, well, perfect. No, but this was great. And thanks so much for joining us, Todd, and hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, you too. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, bye. All right, thanks for bye. listening. Thanks for listening.